Okay, so we are recording. That's my biggest fear that I, I don't press record. Um, look, welcome everyone to the SB20 Australian Conversation Series 7 on vote preparation. Um, I would like, first of all, as I do every week, to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we met today in Hobart, um, that's the Moanina people, um, and acknowledge their elders past, present and emerging. Um, great to see people from around the world on tonight. Um, good to see you again, Jan. And I think Pippi from Holland Ocean Racing was online as well, emailed me tonight. So welcome, Pippi. I think she's here. Um, and also Duarte from Portugal has been on almost every session we've had. So welcome. Um, and welcome to everyone else who's listening from Australia. Hi, hi Duarte. Um, it gives me great pleasure to welcome tonight's panel, um, Felicity Allison, um, Andrew Smith, and Nick Rogers returns. Um, and I'm Jane Austen. I never introduced myself. I expect you know who this crazy woman is, but uh, anyway, that's that's who I am. Um, Felicity, would you like, and, and Andrew and Nick, would you like to introduce yourselves to the panel, Fee? Perhaps if I start with you. Okay. Um, introduce for the audience, I should say. You are the panel. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Jane. Hi everyone, um, I'm Felicity Allison. Uh, I have been sailing most of my life and um, but got into SB20s four years ago um, and we have an all women's team um, which has lots of challenges but lots of fun and uh, our main aim is to get out on the water every Thursday night for teams race for our uh, twilight racing um, and switch off a little bit and enjoy the, enjoy the sailing. Um, we get to do a few regattas along the way as well, uh, but we're, we're not at the front of the fleet. I have to just point that out to everyone before we start. Uh, we're more definitely towards the back, but at the same time, we're definitely out to learn. So tonight I'm, I'm here to learn and ask a few questions as well. <laughs> Thanks, Jane. No worries. I'd also like to say that Felicity and the Cook Your Own um, Dinner team are the actual Australian um, SB20 current champions in the women's division. So um, don't undersell yourself there, Faye. And was one of the one of the most regular crews that we have on the water. Um, Andrew, how about you? Can you let you give us yeah, your uh, well, I'm a I'm a generational Tasmanian, and like uh, Felicity and pretty much everyone in the fleet have grown up sailing on the Derwent. I, I did sabots and 12 foot cadet dinghies and then a lot of keelboat stuff and uh, went around the place and overseas a bit doing keelboat stuff, but was drawn back into the SB20 fleet by sludge really. Uh, he loaned me his boat for a charity sail day that we did and, and uh, really pushed and prompted me to buy a boat uh, so he could bash me up and beat me on the race course. Um, and uh, it was the best thing I ever did. I got into this fleet, which is is which grew, was three or four years ago, and was growing because the world championships were in Hobart. And I just got bitten by the bug, and really, I did a. Our program was a three-year, three worlds, maybe four, which we were due to go to Portugal this year, and we got uh, we got bashed up in cows and made a lot of mistakes and. We were quite wounded after Hobart in our home waters, but we, you know, I changed a lot of things to go to France and that's probably what we'll talk about tonight. And we're not at the front of the fleet either, but we're climbing up the fleet and we're getting more consistent in this really hot fleet that quite honestly, if, you, if you're in the top 10 boats in this fleet on a regular basis, it's anyone's race from what I can see, so. Thanks, Andrew. And um, Andrew was uh, the bronze medalist in the uh, World Championship in here in France last year. Um, and Nick, could you give us a snapshot? Well, I introduced the class 10 years ago in 2010. Um, a friend of mine uh, told me about the boat, the SB20, and uh, uh, I had a look at it. And I thought, this is a perfect boat for Tasmania. Well, it's a perfect boat for everybody, but for Tasmania, it was just a brilliant boat. Everybody could sail this boat. It didn't discriminate against, um, no matter how old, uh, male, female, it was just a beautiful boat. It full of proof and, and, and I pushed the boat very, very hard uh, for uh, many years. And uh, then it took over on its own. Uh, people like Sludge. I remember Sludge, I was chasing Sludge for a fair while, Andrew, uh, to get him in the class. 
And uh, I said, um, you know, six months later, I was still trying to chase him. He said, listen, what? I'll tell you what I'll do, Nick. I'll get in the class. I'll buy a boat, but I want your boat. And I thought, hmm, you know, I'll just tune this boat up. It's going well. <laughs> so, so Andrew Sludge ended up, and so uh, uh, Sludge ended up with my boat. And, uh, and he brought, like yourself, uh, Andrew, and many others into the, uh, the class. And it is sort of just uh, self perpetuated It just it has just built up and up and up, and uh, it's just been fantastic. Mm. And uh, you're right, we have a very very strong uh, uh, a lot of people sailing the SB20 and good sailors, even even down the back end. Some of our really top sailors uh, have been down the back end. Ask Brett, he knows. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very much, everyone, and welcome. And again, don't, don't forget that if you'd like to ask a question to the panel, um, you feel free to pop that in the chat um, or you can interrupt as we're going. I think we can, we can accommodate that, no problem. Um, so the, tonight we've got a, a, a focus on boat preparation, but before we do that, um, Nick has had a few more thoughts after our second session on boat tuning last week. So we're going to just have a a quick look at some um, boat measurement, um, sorry, at, um, mast measurement um, diagrams that Nick has got. So it's going to take us through a few little things there and then we'll get into the boat preparation discussion um, proper. And towards the end, if we've got some time, last week we did talk about training regimes and Nick's happy to share how, what his approach to training is, um, whether you're either sailing on your own or against others. So that might be interesting as well, but we'll see how we go for time. So um, Nick, I'll hand over to you just to, to take us through um, your, uh, your few slides there from, for tonight. Okay, um, last week um, or fortnight ago, we were talking about uh, rig tuning, um, how to uh, set your mast up, um, you know, which uh, wire, you know, the V1s and the, the Ds and the Lilies, which ones to tighten and so on. And it was very interesting listening to what Twirler was saying. The only thing that worried me a little bit was, um, you've got to remember all this stuff. And so uh, I've got a, uh, I'll just see if I can dig it up here. And uh, where is it? You know what, Joan, I've lost it. Oh, okay. So go down the bottom to, to your, just toggle down the bottom to share screen and you'll be able yep. to share your screen and then go to that diagram, that, that first one. That. Um... Yeah, well, listen, I'll tell you what, I better try and find these because I've lost them. They've gone. They've gone. So oh, okay. uh, there's an amateur area to go here. So. Uh, you can unshare your screen if you want yeah, okay. and find. Yeah, just let me uh, dig these up. I don't know why they're not there. They should have been there. I reckon I've yeah. lost them all. You might need to oh. um, log off even and open them up and then come back onto the Zoom link. Um, that might yeah, be right. So if, we, if we, you disappear, we'll um, come back on, open them up and then come back on. All right, no worries. Um, okay, bear, bear with me. We'll bear with you. All Thank right. You. I might go to um, to you, Andrew. We might just change the order of what we're doing. How does that sound? Yeah. Yep. All right. So, I guess this is you know for, for someone who is approaching a, a um, getting the boat back onto the water to get race ready. What's your approach in terms of your your methodology um, to to get your boat ship shape for the start of the season? What I'm looking for all the time. I mean, there's a few things. What what I've found out about the SB20s over a period of time is that the, all the boats are different. So there's the new boats and the old boats. So the, the old boats are obviously softer and the new boats are stiffer. So that's uh, very quickly reflected when you play when, with retentions on the new boats. For the stiffer boats, you get more of a reaction and you can, uh, you can get more progression. Um, but really you've got to play around and learn your boat. And the, the cycle that we went through, I think in the first year and the first 18 months in the SB20s is we wanted continuous improvement and we were hungry for information. So you're asking all the guys, you, you, you know, you're sidling up to Nick and watching what they're doing or, or Sludge. And the thing that you see 
with the good guys is they're all boat tinkerers. They all play around with their boats and their preparation. It's not mistake. Their preparation is excellent. And you can see that with the French in particular. They love tinkering with their boats. And But for me, uh, having good preparation on the boat is taking the boat out of the equation. So when we go sailing, we want it to be us against the elements, knowing that the boat's in good order and being able to do what we want to do in the race and not having something break or having something not set up. But in that first 18 months, we, we were, I was too hungry for information and I went information overload. And then I went back to the way that, that I run my business and I try and simplify everything in the business. I want continuous improvement. But at work, we have a rule that if you, you have to explain anything, if you can't explain it in three lines, it's not repeatable, it's not scalable, it's probably not worth talking about. And we do the same thing on the boat. We keep everything really, really simple and concentrate on the things that are going to give us the most improvement. So it's understanding um, if your boat's stiff or it's not stiff. It's understanding that if you turn a rig on two turns, are you going to get a reaction where your base is, where you're going to work from? And really knowing that when you go out on the water from a gear perspective, that nothing's going to break or, and, and it will, inevitably it will. You lose a spinnaker or trawl a spinnaker or, or hit someone to do something, but hopefully nine times out of 10, you're going to go out in that race and you don't have to worry about something on the boat not doing exactly what it should do. So that's really how we uh, we set up. I, um, I I look at our boat as an asset. You'll, you'll notice it's not in the yard at the moment. I put it in the shed in winter. I want to look after. I want to keep the whole stiff. Um, so and I go from there. And if I'm going to when we go sailing and the first time we get it out, I'll polish it and clean it. And that's partly because I want it to look good, but it's partly because I want it to be slippery in the water. And when I wash it all down, I'll look at everything and see that everything's all right and, and everything's there and I'm not going to turn up in the boatyard and not have anything or, or something's going to be broken. Uh, probably send the sails to Stewie and get him to look over the kites and make sure they're okay and, and have a look at those and then spend probably a, a, a huge amount of time. And I do this with all of them. I do it myself is just and making sure the rig's straight. So my thing is I want to know, regardless of the tension, that when I leave the dock, I absolutely know that the rig's straight. And I've got a, a plan that I go through. You can do it with a laser or you can just do it with a heavy weight on the, on the uh, main halyard and the jib halyard quite successfully. Um, and this is what I did in France. And, and uh, the way I set my boat up is exactly the way I set the new boat up when I got to France in Hiers for the for the Grand Slam and then went through the whole process again for, uh, for the Worlds and, and we certainly didn't have a problem with boat speed. So in terms of um, uh, things that can go wrong, I mean, when you're going, basically doing a, a sort of top to toe of the boat, um, mm -hmm. you know, and all the, the different um, components, some things are, are more likely to be put under more pressure than others. Things, so how would you, uh, and I've got some some different things here to sort of talk about. So you, you spreader brackets. What are you looking for with spreader brackets? Yeah, the spreader brackets are pretty notorious for breaking and and uh, they're stainless and they, the old ones in particular seem quite brittle and, and you're looking for any cracks or hairline cracks in those. Uh, the main halyard, sometimes when the boats come out, the main halyards uh, coming from the side, of the mast crane, not from the top and might have a 90 degree turn in it and it is prone to break and that can happen. Um, or you have sharp edge shackles on it that can easily break and you know they can break in a race or a day. Um, the, uh, the tack line on the kite, the, the stainless bit on the front of the spinnaker pole can sometimes be protruding out and chafe that. And they're the obvious, the three obvious things that seem to be you know, consistently um, need maintenance on the boat, for sure. And I think um, it always shatters me when I see someone limp off the race course in a regatta. I know, I think, 
Fraser, I think, was on is online tonight. I think he had problems um, when we were in Triabunna in the Nationals in March. Um, and I always hear the gudgeon word, which I find is always a fascinating word. What what mm. goes on with gudgeons and rudders? Well, there's so much pressure on the rudders, and uh, they because they really zip along. I mean, 17 knots for a, for a 20 foot boat is putting a lot of pressure on. Uh, it's quite a heavy rudder as well, um, and the the bolts loosen, and and they need they need tightening quite regularly, um, and quite often. The first time you realise that they're loose is is halfway up the first work when you're out there racing. You, it's not something you look at. Um, so you know the pressure when you're sailing is much greater, and they'll rattle. They won't rattle when you're sitting on the on the marina before you're there to go. So yeah, that's that's obviously the other the other major component that uh, consistently you know seems to give the boats a problem. And Nick, you're, you're back online. How are you going there? Um, we, we might just keep going with our sort of boat preparation and come back to the, the, the slide deck you wanted to share with us. But Nick, what's your approach um, to getting your boat ready? I mean, obviously, you're a Tasmanian distributor for the SB, or Australian distributor for the SB20. Um, how do you approach um, uh, preparation of, a, of not so much a new boat, but a, a boat that you're bringing out of winter hibernation. Well, I'm sorry about I missed a bit of uh, Andrew, so I apologise if I've actually repeated what you've already said. Uh, but um, definitely um, uh, giving the boat a good polish is uh, very important. Um, some of the, um, one of the most important things that I check is the keel crane. Uh, I don't know whether you mentioned that, uh, Andrew, or not, but um, the, uh, you've got to be very, very careful. That's the most dangerous part on the boat. And uh, if that rope is starting to fray, just change it straight away because uh, it'll go at the wrong, when you least expect it and somebody will have their feet or toes down underneath and, uh, and they'll just chop them off. They'll do damage to the, uh, to the, uh, the case and the keel too. So uh, uh, just uh, always check that before you, um, uh, if, you're, if you're coming out of hibernation and, and you, you're going to start uh, using the boat, uh, that's one thing. Uh, the other thing, of course, is the, uh, the rudder uh, gudgeons. It's uh, not only the gudgeons, the actual little inserts. Um, they uh, tend to wear out after a while and uh, it pays to, uh, to fit some new in inserts. They don't cost much, um, but uh, they just keep it, uh, the rudder blade uh, uh, nice and trim in the water, it's not wrapping around all over the place. And certainly what Andrew said about the gudgeons, uh, the bolts, and that's so important to keep an eye on that. Like, you know, even if you put a bigger washer or something inside uh, so that you can actually tighten it up. Uh, some of the older boats used to come out with two different size bolts. So you had uh, your um, uh, quarter inch and three sixteen. So the first thing you do is you take out the three sixteen bolts and put in a uh, quarter one. So you've got four quarter inch bolts that are in there. And that'll hold it nice and firm, but definitely uh, keep an eye on those nuts. Make sure you've got locking nuts on the inside. It's easy enough to get to. The halyard at the top uh, it does fray, um, and uh, you've just got to be aware of that. Uh, if it's, if they're in doubt, fix. Um, don't uh, don't leave it because it will go when you least expect it, and uh, it's uh, not a nice thing. Uh, your spreaders. Um, if you check your spreaders and look at the front of the actual spreader. If it's starting to get a little hairline crack, that is a sign that it's going to break. Uh, so get them str uh, um, changed straight away because uh, another problem. You could lose a mast if they go. Um, you know, uh, the uh, rudder, keel, um, uh, making sure that they're all nicely uh, polished and any chips, uh, just touch them up. Make sure you don't have any chips in there, especially in the leading edge. Um, Make sure it's nice and smooth. Yeah. So, yeah, they're the sort of things. Um, uh, and I come in on a couple of other things that Andrew had mentioned, which, uh, yeah, I agree. Yeah. What about so, um, your jib tracks and goosenecks and those? Yeah, well, the jib track, um, certainly uh, what I've done is where, for some reason or other, they miss out on the first hole where the jib track, when, you, when the jib car comes all the way right in, and um, how many times have you seen a jib track sticking up in the air? You know, like it's, stuck, it's gone up like that when they've gone too far. Um, and uh, what I do is I put a bolt right at the end and never had any problems since. But 
you know. And then any time I see anybody that's, that's got one that hasn't got the bolt in the end, I just tell them I just mentioned, you know, I'd get a bolt in there. Uh, it's a good safety thing. Um, what else were there, Jane, you mentioned? Oh, I was just saying about the gooseneck. Ah, yes, the gooseneck. Um, the, uh, put some tape over the join, of the boom of the gooseneck, uh, because what happens is a spinnaker, when you've got the boom loaded up with the bang, it opens a slight little crack between the gooseneck um, um, and, the, and the boom. And what happens is the spinnaker will jam in between that when you're pulling it up and could quite easily rip it. So just put a tape around the join um, and it's an easy fix. It just stops uh, the kite from getting caught up in there. Um, the um, main sheet block at the top um, uh, on the boom, uh, just keep an eye on the, uh, the actual um, uh, saddle because uh, the uh, saddle can break. Um, some people put a little safety line around the boom and, and uh, through the actual uh, top block, main sheet block, just as a, a preventer just in case of anything going. Um, the same with the saddle down at the bottom on the, uh, on the uh, main track. Um, the saddle will break eventually. It's uh, not uh, that strong. And it usually goes in a decent blow. Um, Harkin bring out a uh, replacement fitting, which on, our, on all the new boats now have got this fitting on there, uh, which is uh, a good solid fitting that holds the actual main sheet block uh, to the, uh, the car. Nick, uh, we have quite often problems with our spinnaker pole getting yeah. stuck. Yep. Um, and I know sometimes you get your tack line get caught in there too. Have you got any tips for um, getting that prepared, ready for um, your sailing? Is there any little tips on that? Yeah, I run my tack line on the outside of the, uh, uh, on, on the deck. I don't put it through the, the holes uh, because as soon as you lead it down into the actual, uh, uh, into the hollow, it drops, it just drops down in between the pole and just jams it. So when you're trying to pull the pole out, um, it just won't move, it just gets jammed. So when you um, um, connect it up, just put it on the top um, and keep it away from the actual pole itself so it doesn't jam. You, you, you see what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. What about, um, about shrouds and the kite bag? Is there anything particular there that we, the team needs uh, to concentrate on in terms of preparing your boat or just general boat maintenance? Uh, the kite bag uh, is usually pretty good. I haven't had any problems with the kite bag. Um, the, definitely make sure you've got a good tie down system to keep the kite bag in the boat. Uh, because if you do lay the boat over and uh, you've got the kite still hanging out of the boat and uh, uh, the kite bag could quite easily follow um, if it's not tied in. Um, a lot of the earlier boats come uh, with a shock cord. Um, I wouldn't use the shock cord. I would actually uh, tie it on so it's tied on nice and tight um, to hold it in place. Um, the uh, What else was there, Jane? I was just saying about shrouds. Sorry, Andrew, you go. If, if you look, I mean, you just, if you follow what the kite's doing, there's so many places from the kite bag to the top that it can get caught and jammed and they're all the nooks and crannies. So if you look at the boats and walk along, you can see most people have got shock cord that's, that are tied between the diagonals and the caps and in all the nooks and crannies, you tape up the, the, uh, any metal bits on the, on the, um, the lowers, the very low lowers, so it gets through there nicely. You don't want it going between the mm. caps and the diagonals and all the way to the top and just follow it to the top. And if you look at the boats when you walk across, you can see where everyone's trying to take that tight little gap out of the equation with a tiny bit of shock cord. You know, there's one round the forestay at the very top, which will stop it going between the forestay and the mast so the kite can go right to the top really quickly. Because the reality is when you get to that top mark, uh, the guy that's pulling that kite up is not stopping. You know, just because he feels it get a bit tighter or tug. So if you don't, if you don't make sure that it can go up without getting jammed, it's going to be in two pieces every time. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, and what about? Um, I mean, it, it seems strange, but keeping the boat dry. Um, you know, obviously you're sailing water, but when the when the boat's up on the trailer, what, what's your approach there? Just in mm. terms of yeah, ongoing maintenance. Yeah, I, I just think, you know, you've got to love your boat. 
um, you just treat it like an asset and you love it and uh, you want to keep it clean and dry and you know if we hose the boat down and give it a good clean we'll go and have a beer and then put the cover on and wait for it to dry a bit and uh, always make sure the portholes are, are well closed when we're doing that and really check the boat not all the time not fastidious about water like the boats don't leak too badly really I think they're quite good not like some of the boats um, um, but yeah it has to be dry I mean you don't want water in your boat we uh, the boat that we chartered in England when we went to the worlds in cows was sinking every race um, you know we had 100 litres of water in it in one race. We literally spoke to a chase boat about we were going to step off it. Yeah. So it was leaking everywhere. Um, that wasn't any fun. I thought about that, I think. It's, isn't it six months in a leaking boat? But you only yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that was a lesson. So um, from an idea from the, your rudder and looking after the your rudder after you've sailed, there's... We've had two sort of sides of the story. Put it back in its bag, make sure that it's protected, and then other people say, no, keep it out week between week to let it dry out so that it's not um, touching any fabric. Um, what, what do you think about that, Nick and Andrew? Uh, well, definitely I wouldn't put uh, the uh, rudder in the bag, uh, especially if it's wet. Um, I would um, um, lay the rudder out um, in the boat uh, gently. Um, I have, um, you know, those little uh, noodles, the pool noodles. Yeah. I just chop them up into little small um, pieces and I just put them underneath uh, to support the uh, the rudder and uh, it just allow it to dry out. So again, um, that breathing concept of keeping the boat as dry as possible yeah, between, yeah. between each, each... What do you rudder? reckon, Andrew? Yeah, no, it's a, it's a friction game. I really... I think the foils, you've got to look after them as much as you possibly can, rudder and keel. Uh, you don't want to knock them around when you're moving the boats around. And uh, look, I, I, I'm, I'm always taking all the gear off the boat and taking it home and just trying to look after it all as much as I can all the time. And um, it comes back to me with, with a good rudder, making sure it's smooth and clean and, and works is just, I don't want to think about that when we're out there sailing. I don't even want to know about that. I want to make sure when we leave the dock that we've prepared that so that that's not in my mind because the only thing we want to think about is is trying to keep up with, beat you off the start and keep up with Nick up the first work. That's all we want to think about. I don't want to think about the boat. And if I thought my mind goes in my preparation, if I go out on the start line and I think that our master's, not set up right or I haven't polished the boat so I think that Nick has polished the boat and I haven't polished the boat my mind will go there that's the way it goes so I do it to try and eliminate all those one percenters so that when I line up with the guys with the whole fleet and you want to beat them you think right we're on a level playing field we go from here forward so, so now that's what now we know your downfall. We can play mind games with you quite happily, can't we? I well, was going to say that, Fee, but you beat me to it. <laughs> well, yes yes and no, because the other thing that I've really worked on, that, you know, that was the learning in the first 18 months. The learning in the second 18 months is if something goes wrong, you can always bounce back. So you, you've got to be resilient as well. And, um, you know, we did that in France. We went round in the second race in, in France we went around the first mark and we were 40s or 50s going around the top mark and we'd already done a circle on the first windward work because there was a distance marker that we got trapped between to, trop, to stop port st um, tackers coming in at the top mark and the French guys drove us outside that and then we had, a, we had a confrontation with them and did a circle. So we were high 40s and then by the bottom mark we were back in the 10s. So, you know, the, the, the other thing about SB20s is if you're resilient and you've got confidence in what you're doing and your gear, I mean, the confidence comes more when you have a bad situation like that, knowing that you've got everything right, helps you bounce back and not think about that. So it doesn't matter whether it works from the dock or you take it from the first mark or you take it to the second lap, you have a bad first lap. If you have confidence in your gear and confidence in your crew, and Nick, you're the master at bouncing back, climbing back through the fleet. Um, 
it, it gives you confidence to do that. So you never lose your bottle, hopefully. Um, just a question. Um, how do you protect boats, the boats from osmosis? I like to, I like store boats. Um, like I said, I like to take the SB because I've got one of the new ones and I thought, well, I want to give it longevity as a boat. I like to get the covers on, get clean them, get them dry, get the covers on them and get them out of the frost for the winter. You know, don't mind them being there in the summer. Um, I even worry about the dark covers on the boats, to be honest. I would put lighter coloured covers and try and get the heat out of them. That hot, cold uh, expansion. But these boats are glass and they're solid glass. So if you don't dent the hull and, and actually have an intrusion into the hull, they should be very, very good. And, you know, the new boats are... are Nick, you'll agree, are, are pretty well made, to be honest. Yeah, they are. Uh, just going back to uh, talking about uh, water in the boat and that, when you actually have your uh, boat sitting on the hard, um, wind the uh, jockey wheel down uh, because the water will collect in the well uh, where the kite pole is. And if you wind, the well, wind it down, uh, the water will run out and there will only be a very small amount of water. But if you leave it up, then it'll collect a lot of, lot of water over, you know, like when it rains over a week or whatever. Um, that was one thing. The other thing, actually, before we move off, um, uh, talking about your boats being launched and that, I don't know if we brought that up or not. Um, some boats are craned in. Uh, all our boats are uh, wheeled in on the trailers. Um, when you put the boat in the water, make sure you chock the actual keel because many times I've seen people putting their boats in the water and the keel, the, the actual keel is not sitting on the base of the trailer and it is banging around inside the case that's not good you know you're knocking uh, knocking the, the trailing and uh, leading edge off and damaging the boat same when you're coming out um, what I do with my guys is as the boat's coming out of the water just as it um, it just comes out of the water we, uh, and it's on the trailer we drop the keel down on the trailer so the keel can't move and, uh, and then we pull it up the rest of the way uh, and put it into space. Um, going down, no need to, um, uh, to wind the, uh, the uh, keel up because uh, as you, the trailer goes in the water, you get deeper and then the actual keel will leave uh, the trailer. Just got to make sure that it's on its uh, ratchet. Um, it's be embarrassing if you actually launched it and the keel dropped down. Mm. Especially if the photographer was right there. Um, we went up to Triabunna on the East Coast for the first time to, to sail the Nationals this year. Um, did that present any additional challenges to you in terms of boat prep? And, and obviously you're not um, next door to PJs in, um, in, in Hobart, so you don't have, uh, so for, our, for our online friends from um, overseas, it's a local ship chandery. But um, what gear do you take up to make sure you've got everything there? I mean, Nick, you had some spare, spare gear up there, but what challenges did Triabunna throw up? And just before I, I go, I, I think I need to ask maybe Will um, to mute his mic. I can't, for some reason I can't mute you, Will. He's um, somewhere we've got a little bit of background noise there. Um, I think that might be Will Allison, but yeah. anyway. Um, so going back to back to Tribun, are any challenges there for, for boat prep, especially during the regatta? We had pretty pretty heavy weather there for a while. We had lots of gin. Gin, <laughs> I like it. Yep, it's fine. <laughs> I would be packing that first thing. <laughs> look, for our, look, I have to say, um, it was our first regatta away for us. So um, Jill Abel, um, who sails with me, for us to take the mast down and put it back up. We had a lot of learning to do. Um, we did learn a lot. Uh, we had Sam Tiedemann helping us and he was, he was great. However, we had to do a lot more steps than we used to. So Jill and I literally had the tick box going down with the list of things that we had to do, um, taking photos of when we, before we took it down so we knew how to put it all back together afterwards. So going away, um, even with the trailer for us, getting that ready uh, was a big, a big step for us. But I have to say it was a really rewarding one because we did it all. We got the mast up. We had it all rigged up. We set it all up ourselves. Um, 
you know, we had people there helping us as well, but it was very rewarding for us. And I think I'd be happy to go away again with our boat now after having that opportunity and feeling that we could do it. Yeah. And did that give you greater um, confidence when you're on the water? I think what, just picking up on Andrew's point about, you know, knowing you were sort of ship shape ready to go, did, you, did that give you more confidence on the water when you're, when you're out there? I think if something had gone wrong, we probably would have been a little bit more, oh, yeah, I know where that's come from now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that sort of response. I know that sounds a little bit naive and maybe a little bit um, basic, but there are so many bits and pieces and I've been sailing since I was 11 in various boats and every boat seems to have a little bit different. Oh, gee, God, where did that come from? You find it in the bottom of the boat. Uh, so, yes, I think it did, but I think in, as a whole, it just made us feel like a sense of achievement that we'd actually could do these things ready for another regatta. Bit, bit of the mind games again there happening for us. Yeah. Andrew, how about you? Did... Um... Uh, in, tri in Tribuna, how did um, your boat preparation um, hold up out there? Do we have to talk about Orford, really? Um, well, <laughs> I've already boosted the, 100 times with a bronze medal, come on. <laughs> it's, it's literally when the world ended. Um, uh, oh, it was a nightmare for us. Um, so our, our progression was that we... Um, we went to France and did really well, but we've never won a trophy in Tasmania. And then we'd done the state championships and we got fourth. We we're only one point out of third and didn't finish two races. I fell out of the boat and we had more wins than anyone, including Chris Dare in that regatta. So we, we felt like we were, I guess, in the top three quick boats in the state championships and we're rim with it. And so we did the did the whole package. So I packed the van and polished the boat, and it was all polished up and ready to go. And we used to packing the boat down and up, and went to uh, Orford on the Friday at about four o'clock, and it was just all turned to custard for there for us. We um, we were about to be the first uh, horticultural business in Australia to do compostable packaging, and we just received all this machinery that had arrived that day from the UK arrived on a ship which was six weeks late and I was driving to Orford with the boat on the back and uh, I got a phone call to say they'd sent the wrong machinery from Europe and uh, so half a million dollars worth of machinery turned up and it was all wrong so I was on the phone literally all night to the UK trying to negotiate with them to get the right machinery so I didn't sleep at all on the Friday night and then we went out there on the Saturday and it blew and it blew really hard it blew harder before we started racing than when we started racing. And we had a full day out there sailing um, and we had a pretty ordinary day, I think we were 11th or 12th, which knocked the confidence around and we'd come out, we'd come out of the state championships with some confidence, but we were, I was pretty shattered at the time. And we went home and had a good night's sleep and uh, sailed on the next day and we were second lowest point scoring boat, got us back in the hunt. We were mid five, fifth or sixth with Sludge. The only goal was to beat Sludge, by the way. That was the only goal from there. And by that time, uh, Brett and um, who won? Um, Will. Uh, Will Sergeant. Yeah, Will Sergeant. I mean, Sarge was on fire. Uh, we felt like he was all over us on the first day and then uh, he was going really, really well. And it was really only those two that were miles out in front. And then we uh, we went for a load of wood on the Sunday, but mentally I was pretty shattered by then. And we're still trying to get the right machinery here. It's still been going and been COVID as well. So it's, uh, it's for us, Orford was when the world ended in, in many ways. <laughs> I feel terrible bringing it up now. I was only wanting to explore your boat preparation, but uh, we're, we're well, coming up high though, weren't we, anyway? Well, no, no, we put a lot of, I mean, this is what it's all about, though. It's all about that adversity and, and trying to still do well regardless. Everyone's got issues. Um, the boat preparation was pretty good. Um, it was a really difficult place to sail, I've got to say. It was really, they're all difficult. All the regattas are difficult, whether they're on the Derwent or in France or Portugal. Or, but Orford was really interesting. It was all over the place and um, incredibly tactical. And, uh, you know, it, it, it was good. It, we, we felt like, we, again, we had some speed, particularly on that second day, so the boat wasn't the problem. Yes. Uh, it was us. Oh, well. 
it was it was a, a great a great adventure for everyone. Um, Nick, um, how about you in terms of um, Triabana sailing sailing up there? I mean, it, there was a pretty heavy weather um, that the team was sailing in. Oh, it was uh, it was very nice. I enjoyed it. I um, I think uh, leaving um, uh, Sandy Bay. Um, um, from the DSS and the Royal, where we are really spoiled from those clubs. We have brilliant sailing conditions there. To go up there and in some ways rough it, um, uh, but in the, in the end it wasn't really roughing. It was actually quite well set up. You know, they did a great job up there and and um, the, uh, the wind was uh, testing, it was different. Uh, everybody had to uh, learn the conditions. It, it wasn't uh, where uh, some know some areas it, it, on the doant uh, better than others, but uh, certainly I think uh, it was uh, certainly testing for everybody up there and uh, we had a ball, we enjoyed it. Second day wasn't too hot for us. First day and the last day were good for us, but uh, um, yeah, I think everybody was getting a bit aggressive on the second day. <laughs> <laughs> they had their game face on, Nick. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I know that we've got um, Duarte and Pippi and Jan from um, from Holland and Portugal. Have you got any questions at all that you'd like to to put to the um, or any discussion points? Anything you do differently in in your parts of the world with SB twenties or how are you approaching things? Yes, for Nick actually. Um, Nick was telling something about the diagonals and then some. Something in the top that you have to look at, but that seems to be not clear for me. So if you just can reveal that again, please. Are we talking about the the uppers? Are you the uh, yeah. the, the upper spreaders and the? Uh... Okay. Well, um, basically, what you're doing is um, you don't want those on too tight. Well, you know, like I've. I know the French seem to like to play around with them. Um, I don't know of anybody here in Hobart that plays around with them because as what uh, Twirler said last, um, uh, last fortnight was really you don't need them in the boat, uh, but you do need them in the boat to hold the mast in the boat when you're going downhill in a blow. Uh, so they, all they're there for is just to hold the mast in the, in the boat. So I'd have them loose. Um, there is a measurement that you can use, um, uh, and uh, the best way to uh, get them to that measurement is to take them off the actual upper spreaders and, and lay them along the mast until they're exactly the same and then lock them off and then put them back on again. And a good test is uh, when you've got the, the uh, boat in the boat park with the mast up, uh, rigged and ready to go, just pull the backstay on and you can see um, whether they're both easing at the same time or one might be easing quicker than the other. So then all you need to do is just readjust it until they're both easing at the same time. Um, but certainly, in my opinion, um, I wouldn't be having them on tight. They'd be, they'd be loose. And, and you wouldn't need to pull the backstay on very much before they start going loose. Does that Thank you. answer your question there? Yeah, no? we... Uh... We already uh, did that and we're actually not uh, using the uppers neither. We just taped them, we put them hand tight, have the same length and taped them. Yep. Yep. That's Thanks. It. Um, this probably seems a basic question for you, but um, in terms of polish, are there differences in terms of polishes? Have we all got, do we all use the same to, to polish the hull of a boat or are there variations in terms mm -hmm. of polish? I think the uh, the polish that's got the anti-fouling in it is most probably the best one uh, because if you're actually going to be in a regatta and it's going to, the boat's going to be sitting in the water for uh, three or four days, um, you need that. Uh, what's it called, Andrew? Um, uh, I'm not sure. I, I was going to say the, the easiest uh, one. The easiest <laughs> one to put on. <laughs> Yarn's got it. That's this feels like an ad. <laughs> ah, that's it. Yeah, yeah. That's, yeah. that's the one. That's what I would use. I I use the easiest one to the easiest one to put on and off. You know, I do it. Through Andrew and get them down there. Well, well, I'll probably do it honestly in a season here with the boat. I'd probably polish it four times, maybe five times. So when you look at that in time frame, it's probably once every six weeks, really. So it's pretty clean and it's pretty good. Try not to leave the boat in the water. Um, 
you leave the boat in the water for three or four days and you've got a whole lot of growth on there that you've got to get off. It actually, you can literally have to really get some elbow grease to get it off and get it back where you want it. You can notice it. Um, so the one I use is, um, I like things easy, so. Fair enough too. Um, in terms of when we did go to Tribun, and when we had the, which is about an hour away from Hobart um, for, for our international friends, um, the trailers, there seemed to be a flurry of activity around getting <laughs> trailers organised. Um, what, what did we learn from that? Other than the, wheel, the wheel bearings last a, a year and a half, maybe, if you're going to cart the boats. In fact, you, you do it every year, but it's 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 thirty dollars worth of wheel bearings uh, if you do it properly, and uh, you can get some seals. I've got some caps on mine that keep the grease in when you put the trailer in the water, and seals on the insides. And but still, yeah, if you're gonna, if we were to go to the Tamer next year, I I'd, I'd probably change the wheel bearings again between now and then. You don't want to be halfway up the Midlands. <laughs> Um, it's not a good, it's not a good look, and you fight it for the rest of the fleet. Yeah, and um, and Felicity might just wave as you're going past. I don't know that she's correct. Sick. <laughs> correct. <laughs> um, we've uh, Will Allison has said that the Harkin Speed Polish is the name of that um, polish. Um, there you go. So I'm not sure. That's it. Um, okay, I'm interested. Um, I think I might just have one more question. Um. Nick, your presentation, how did you go with your slides? Are you right to, to go back or? Okay, well, yeah, sure. Let's uh, have a crack at that. We were talking about um, last uh, fortnight um, about adjusting your rig, um, your cap shrouds and the lowers. And I mentioned about the VDLs. So how about if I just explain a little bit about the VDLs and how they work? So just bear with me, I shall dig it up. And this time I should have it. I'm confident. I am too. Oh dear, oh dear. You, uh, I suppose you're gonna see only the small one here. Just bear with me. Can we, that, can we click on it or? No, uh, what I'll do is uh, I reckon I have got I think the whole thing's all mucked up. Sorry, yeah, Jane. That's all right. I know that you can do. We've already been through it once, and we know we know you can do it. It's um, it's just when you've got faces staring at you, so okay. suddenly everything seems hard. There you go. Have we got it there now? Yep, you're all good. Okay. Yes. All right. Well, let's have a look here. Now, you notice actually that um, the uh, just bear with me. I'll tell you what. There we are. Oh dear, oh dear. I am an amateur at uh, this, so. Um, and We're just, all learning new skills, Nick. Don't yeah, panic. <laughs> yeah, that's that's the key. Don't panic, and I've got it. Now we're in action. Um, we've got it up here. Can you all see that? Yeah. Okay. All right. Now, you'll notice down here. You can see my little pencil. You all see my little pencil there? Yep. Yeah. Okay. You can't. All right. Well, how about if I put a spotlight on? Can you see that? Yes. Okay, well, you see here that I've got a yellow tape and a black tape um, and on each one of them. Now, you can see inside, you can see the screw there on the bottle screw. So when, if you set those markings to your dock settings, you can then um, look at that when you're out sailing to make sure that you're not, uh, as, a, as a quick uh, reference, you can make sure that you're not go, getting out of skew with on your actual um, your settings um, and uh, it's easy enough to see and having the uh, tape just on the one side uh, when you go to turn a turn um, a turn you know that you're getting a full turn not a half turn if you've got a half turn then of course you've got the yellow on the wrong side on that side there um, and another little trick here too when you when you've done your uh, settings um, See the rope, how the rope runs through the center of the actual um, uh, uh, screw there. Um, and it comes out and goes around the little bracket in there. Uh, that keeps them in line so that they don't twist. If you go around this part, rather than going around this part here, you'll find that as soon as the rig goes loose on the leeward side, uh, it'll start to twist a bit. 
So this just holds it in place and it means you don't lose half a turn um, if you, you know, so that uh, uh, you keep your rig all set uh, correctly. Now, what I'll do here is uh, just move on, I think, radio. So now this is the V1s and the Ds and the little is. So um, when, we're, uh, uh, when we've got the boat set up um, in, um, on the dock and we've got our dock settings, uh, we get out on to the start line and we'll race or we'll sail up and down the course, see how the sails look. And if we need to make any adjustments, which I'll just get here, if we need to make any adjustments here, we can just add a turn. So if you can imagine this on the side of your boat, inside on, uh, on the bulkhead, on the side tank, and you've got one on the other side as well. So here I have put on three turns, three full turns. So I've, in, I've increased the pressure on the Vs. And here I've actually, this is from dock settings, I have increased the pressure two turns. Now, I might decide that I want to do another turn or another two turns. So I write down two more on it. Well, actually, uh, my crew will do that. Usually Simon will do that for me. And um, so I know now that I'm five up from dock settings. Now, the breeze has dropped off and we might have, say, three races in a day. So, so that you don't lose where you were, you take off, say, for instance, you want to take off two turns off the V1s. So all you do is just put a cross through it there and a cross through there. So you, you've crossed them out, but, and you've still only got the three pluses there. And the reason why you don't rub them out is that after racing, when you want to write down uh, how you had the boat set up, you've already got it on the side of your tank here, and you can actually just duplicate it into a log so that you know where you are. Um, and then if you say, for instance, the breeze does change completely and you end up back at dock settings, you cross them all out now, um, you need to take some more off. So what do we do? We go on the other side. Okay, so that's, that's the after side of the V. So you understand where I'm coming at there? Yep. Right, now the same here with the D. So there's these ones here, as you can see, we've put two on there and we might want to drop some off there and put another one, might want to put, take two off. So we've put two um, strikes there for, um, for them to uh, be taken off. And we've always got that there. Uh, so, um, uh, and that makes, makes it nice. And this is your little ones. This is your little um, um, small, um, um, what are they, I suppose, are these. Um, uh, they go, just go to the gooseneck. Um, normally, I have them just uh, tight, just just on. And um, if if you're using a bit of bang, if the breeze is coming up, they'll then you know I'd most probably want to put a, a turn turn on or maybe two turns. Any uh, has anybody got any questions on that? Do they understand what I'm saying there? No questions. Good. Okay. Coming out of that. Right, yeah. what else was there that I was going to mention? Um, okay, so now we're talking about, um, we want to be able to uh, write this all down afterwards. So this is the log sheet that I use. So here you've got uh, the boat, the placings I had, say for instance, or three races, I put down the placings, the date, uh, the race, the time. Um, now we've got my dock settings. And uh, then you've got the V, D, L. So you've got your, your V1s, the Ds, and the little Es. So I've got them all set up. Now, uh, you might notice here that this is on the loose gauge, you know, the, the uh, metric loose gauge. You most probably notice on the little Es there is my dock settings, I've got 24. Well, as you most probably aware, when you pull the loose gauge on the little Es, uh, they don't read anything. So what I do is I lift the wire over the, uh, the bigger part of the, plastic, of the uh, nylon wheel 
and I can get a reading. And that way I can actually get it more exact uh, for the, uh, the lilies. So even though it's showing 24, it's actually uh, most probably just reading five or seven or something like that. Um, and then you've got uh, your four state tension here. Most of this stuff here, it would be, uh, the four state would be set at dock settings. Uh, but if I've done some turns, I'll just put them up here at the top here. And, um, and so I've got a, a fair idea of what I've been doing during the race. And of course, then when you go through here, just going as we're on the log, I'll just sort of go through uh, the wind conditions, the tide, um, uh, the crew weight. That's always important. You know, like, uh, uh, am I sailing with maximum weight or am I a bit light? It's always good to have this information uh, in front of you because the reason why, if you write it all down, you'll most probably remember everything that you've done uh, for about two or three days and then you'll get on with life and doing other things. Then come next weekend and you'll think, oh, what do we do then? Um, did we do this or that? You've always got a log, it's always written down and you can go six months, 12 months, two years, you'll always have this information. And, um, and then of course here, the sails you're using, using the mainsail, um, um, the traveller, how you use the traveller, the luff, the outhaul, the vang, uh, backstay, what sort of work. And these are only just little small um, reminders of what you've been doing. And then your kite, uh, your jib, and the jib height off the deck, uh, the uh, jib luff, how tight you had that on, uh, the hull at the, um, at the clue, and also the car, you know, um, how many holes you were um, uh, in. On the uh, on the car on the jib car, and then you then you go into here and then you write down all the explanations about everything, and uh, and I find all of that sort of I still write them down, you know. And I've been doing it for a while, so uh, and I enjoy actually uh, reading some of the things, especially when you do when you have some a good run. You must have a good folder of all of those um, sheets by now, Nick. I do. <laughs> <laughs> And I know there's a few people who'd like to get their hands on it. <laughs> well, I was say, like, Where's a bit of money? <laughs> and do you, Nick, do you use that then with your team during the week, um, strategising for the next week, looking at what's coming up weather-wise? I mean, how do you use that um, week to week? Well, basically, you know, I've got the dock settings already. So when I turn up, um, I know it's basically what the weather's going to be. You can see how they're doing, and as you know, your forecast is most probably never the same as what happens on the river. And um, um, and I know where, how hard I want to put the V's on, and um, how hard I want to, how many turns on I want with the uh, with the uh, V's and D's and uh, and the little E's. Um, I've always got that sorted. I don't uh, play around with them too much. Um, I basically set and forget unless there's a big change. Um, uh, if I wanted to, um, um, if say for instance it blows 20 knots, well you know you're going to strap them on and you need to depower the, the, the boat as, as much as you possibly can. Um, but if it uh, drops down to five, five knots, well then you've got to do some big changes. Andrew, do you have a, a system, anything like, I mean I won't say so as, as um, far as that, but do you, what's your system that you're able to uh, share? Well, we do, but and what we try and do is we try and simplify everything. So again, it's really interesting um, when the Australian guys went to France, and I'll just use that as an example because all the Australian boats were really competitive in that fleet, whether it was the Grand Slam or or France uh, or the Worlds, um, and we all had three very very different um, philosophies in the way that we did it. And for us, it's really simple. And when you talk about preparation, I think you can talk about boat preparation, crew preparation, and then preparation for the regatta outside that. So, uh, for instance, in here, for us, it was about local knowledge, um, learning as much about the area as we could, as we could that we didn't know, even to the to the point of just feeling comfortable sailing in and out of the marina that you're sailing in and out of to get to the racetrack, so that when you go out there in the morning, by the time you get to the line, you're not frazzled and not, you know, worked up in any way. You're just, you're there. And one crew 
was incredibly technical. So um, Elliot had Sam Breary and they had coaching and they were doing really, really long debriefs. And we got invited to some of those early on and I said to the guys, to my guys, this is not gonna work for us guys. It's information overload. It's not what we're used to. It's not what I'm comfortable with. I wanna get back to simplifying every single day that we go sailing back to the least amount of things that we have to think about. You know, the racing was simple for us. Win the start, get to the top mark first and protect. And that was it. That's all we said. We wanted to win the start, get to the top mark first and protect. And we didn't overthink it. How you do that in the middle, it, you know, is, is quite difficult, but that was the game plan and we didn't try and do anything else. And the second thing that we did was we never wanted to start with the French guys. So we didn't want to start alongside the boat that we wanted to beat to the top mark at any time in the regatta. And we never did. In fact, we never saw them. And quite often we'd just meet at the top mark in every single race. So, um, but that was me and I made that call. And that's because I didn't think, well, I knew that I couldn't outstart Robin Farland on the start line. I just knew that. And I said to Chapo, I never want to try because I just don't want to deal with that. So wherever we start, please don't start me next to those guys. And that was a very clear strategy that we stuck to that worked really, really well for us. Um, and the only time we had to change that strategy was in the uh, last race where we wanted to protect third. Uh, we were second going into the second last race and we didn't think we could beat the Russians, so we just had to beat Pollard to maintain third. And that was the only time we diverted from win the start, get to the top mark first and protect. So, but then, but, but we, we kept it very simple. We'd go um, after the race, we'd have 20 minute debrief, talk about what we did right, what we did wrong, whether we needed to change anything. Um, and tried to keep it as simple as it possibly could be. And then we'd go and talk about something else and enjoy the French Riviera. Hey, hey Andrew. Andrew. <laughs> if, you, if I could, have we got time, Joan? Yeah, yeah, we'll, yeah. We'll, we'll wrap up in a couple of minutes, but yeah, okay. go ahead. You talk about your starts. I think that's uh, something very interesting. Um, you, you you had a uh, any tactics of uh, how you wanted to do it, like either end or the middle, or how did, how did you work your starts out? Uh, no, uh, it was an interesting line. So it was a line where the start boat was in the middle and it was pins on either end of the start boat. So it was a very long line, um, at, at port, at port, too long in many respects, much longer than we used to here. And there was always very big holes. So the important thing was, as you know, was to just get in a position. Um, we were mainly midline. We didn't really go one end or the other at any given time. And we wanted enough distance to lure to be able to be full boat speed when the, when the gun went, you know, that big bear away and, and full boat speed going for it. So that was the important thing. And then hold the line. And we were 25, 30 kilos light and we chose to sail light. Uh, we had that discussion going into the worlds that it was a change of seasons. There was probably a 50-50 whether it was going to be heavy and light. And it was both, uh, but mainly light. And I don't think being light hurt us at any point um, in the regatta. So, um, but no, we kept it very, very simple and tried not to blow ourselves away at the start. Um, Chapo is super aggressive boat on boat and, and very much a match racing guy. So when we were close to people that we were trying to beat, he was very, very aggressive during the racing, but very conservative on the start line. Thanks, Nick. Um, are there any final questions from anyone online to anyone online tonight? There's Roger there, he wants a question. Roger, how about you? Good to see you online, Roger. I haven't seen you in a yeah. while. Bonjour for New Caledonia. <laughs> you snuck away very quietly. Uh, <laughs> how did you get there? Did you swim? <laughs> nearly. Yeah, um, day six of 14 of quarantine. Ah, okay. <laughs> another, another set of quarantine. Sorry, um, I digress. Andrew, 
it, what about your uh, rig settings for over there? You said that there was three different, you know, trains of thought on that. What was yours? Just you, you know, yeah. pick a setting and leave it. Sorry. No, no, no. We played with it a lot. Um, what we found was, and um, please don't think this sounds arrogant at all, but I think Twirler coming to Hobart has meant that Hobart is probably a little more advanced in tuning the rigs than the than the French guys. And we sailed with a French guy in the Grand Slam pre-Worlds and he didn't say anything to us, but he took everything we did with our rig and then told the French guys. You know, that was very, very clear. And, and they got better with their rig tunings off us because... Uh, we had a lot of upwind speed on foal and we beat him to the top mark in every single race of the Grand Slam. So we had clear speed on him, but he always got through us tactically. Downwind, he was incredibly quick, incredibly quick. And um, uh, we thought we were ahead. But what we do that the French don't is we run strong, uh, much higher rig settings, much higher. And we're flattening out the, the boat and the main a lot more. And we're doing that probably an extra turn, I reckon, to Nick because we're 35 kilos heavy. And it was interesting what Twirler, we're actually going in a little bit of a different direction from what Twirler spoke about a week ago on the rig tunes. And uh, it doesn't worry me to say that we run, we run very tight caps when we're 25, 30 kilos underweight. And I think that we go okay boat on boat up when 30 kilos light. Mm. Any other questions at all from the panel? Okay. Um, Roger, for you. Fraser, got, sorry. I, I know there's Fraser's there. Uh, he hasn't said anything. I'm sure Fraser would have something to say. Ah, Fraser, no, not putting you under any pressure at all there, but um, have you got any? So, what okay. in particular did you uh, I've, been, uh, I've been driving kids around. Sorry, Jane. Oh, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> I've been driving kids around, so I'm still sitting in the car, but I've, I certainly enjoy all this, guys, and you've done a fantastic job. Thank you. Great to I'll have you on. The on yeah, and um, thank you for the... Uh, going at, uh, trial, but it's one of those things where I knew it wasn't quite right, and I tried to get it fixed, and I should have just done it properly the first time, I think, so... Um, yeah, if, you know, if Wellesley was there, he would have he would have made sure it was done properly. But that's my uh, Achilles' heel. Ah. <laughs> Lack <laughs> of preparation. <laughs> You'd always look like you were having fun, though, guys. Ah, uh, yeah, absolutely. No, but thank you very much, guys. Appreciate all your work. I think that Fraser said that with the lack of preparation. That for us, it was always time. We're four women on board, um, two of us work full-time with kids as well, and we just are always running out of time, always saying, we should have done that, we should have done this, should have been more organised, and we're very good at the should-offs. And I think that's, for me, probably the thing we need to change this season um, and, and start to actually make those should-offs into, yes, we will do it and we've done it for our preparation for our boat. I think, I think Felicity, though, it's, a, it's an interesting point because you see the, uh, the pros get in the fleet and you see them go fast and do really well. They, they actually should because this is all they do. This is all they do. You are a mother, you work, you're trying to run the boat, you're trying to beat a professional on the water. It is amazing that half the fleet is knocking these guys around on a regular basis. It's it's an absolute credit to you. These guys should be a leg ahead of us, really, but because this is all they do and this is all they think about and this is they get paid to do it. So I, I don't think you should be hard on yourself about your lack of preparation. I think you should be hard on the guys that, that aren't beating us by enough that do this every day and should get nothing wrong, to be honest. Oh, I like your attitude, absolutely. <laughs> we, always, we always have the, um, our, one of our main preparations for our regattas is is okay. Who's got the chocolate brownies, and where are the the lolly snakes? <laughs> <laughs> and the post gin, don't forget that. Oh yeah, yeah, it's, and and yeah, the, the chicken parmigiana and the gin when we get back. <laughs> don't don't forget the French only work from Tuesday afternoon till Thursday morning. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> no, that way you're going to New Caledonia, Roger. <laughs> yeah, why, do you think, why do you think I'm here? <laughs> <laughs> Look, um, I, I think we'll wind it up there. Look, thanks very much, everyone, for coming on board and tonight. Um, and I just concur with Andrew, Felicity, you know, the SB20 Women's Champion for Australia, and I'd love to see you. Um, would have been great to see you in cash cash sailing against um, some of the fantastic female sailors over there because I think you, you're probably harder on yourself than you should be. So great to see you always out on the water. Um, thanks, um, Jan and Dehate Pippi um, from um, overseas for joining us again tonight. We really appreciate you coming on board and we hope what we've got to say, what our panels have to say, has been helpful. Um, and if you've got anything you'd like us to, to chat with you about, please let us know. Um, next week, we have the father-son duo of Ollie and Paul Burnell. Um, and we're going to have a bit of a tips and tricks session next next week. So I expect an email from me. Actually, I forgot to say that. You might have had two or three emails from me over the last 24 hours. We had a bit of an email glitch last night. So if I wasn't trying to press the point of joining us. But, um, but uh, yeah, if you, if you got a few emails, that was just an email problem. Um, but if you've got any tips that you, you have on your boat that you'd like to share, I think in the spirit of, um, of generosity, a little tip from someone might be just what someone else needs. So feel free to shoot those through to me via email and um, Ollie and Paul will be on next week with us to have a little bit more of a chat about that. Um, so thanks very much. Have a great um, fortnight and we'll see you, well, we'll see you in 14 days. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Jane. Nice work, Nick. You um, nailed it. So you're a, you're uh, an IT technician, really, aren't you? Yeah, absolutely. It was obvious, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Good job. I only, only tried to share this my screen once, I think, so far, and I, I did that badly, and I was like, oh, God, it's not my thing. <laughs> I know where I made my mistake, Jane. What was that because you shut the windows? I, no, yeah, I shut the windows, but I packed too much in, and I couldn't find it. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you a funny story, Nick, when we were doing the online teaching, which for me was an extremely steep learning curve. I mean, I'm, I'm okay at IT, but, you know, once you're having to do Zoom meetings with 19 six-year-olds on at the same time and how to mute them, unmute them, ensure that somebody's, you know, not upside down. <laughs> I had one little girl who kept, who learned.